Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, offering desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. Now, this week's talk is by Kate Dimbleby and Rue Howe of Stornaway.io. They'll be discussing the potential and challenges of interactive video storytelling, as well as demoing their new authoring tool, which puts the creative process at the heart of its no-code vision. There'll be a Q&A at the end, with the talk running at roughly 30 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window and I'll pick them out to ask the speakers. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions at PM Studio UK. A captioned version of this talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by studio resident and winner of the 2020 Ivor Novello Award for Sound Art, Kathy Hind. She'll be talking about her attempts to rewild water data and she'll share sounds, images and experiences from her encounters with watery environments. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, press the button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. For now, I'm going to hand over to Kate and Rue. Thank you so much, Martin, and thank you for inviting us to be here today. Yeah. Uh, we wish we could be there in person. Um, we're a Bristol-based company, so we are just around the corner. And just so you know, we are um, we live together, so we're not breaking any COVID rules by <laughs> sitting next to each other. Um, I'm Kate Dimbleby. I'm a creative producer with a background in theatre and music primarily. I'm always interested in interactive because I've worked for 20 years in small rooms with my audience right in front of me, layering music and story in all sorts of ways. Um, and I'm now creative director of Stornaway.io. I'm Rue Howe and I have spent the last 25 years messing around with film and digital um, and working by myself and also with large media companies sort of at the intersection of technology and film as a lot of you have in different creative ways and and uh and i think by pure coincidence this is uh three years to the day from when i was sitting in watershed uh at idox 2018 the interactive documentary symposium that was one of the triggering points for this project for stornaway which was um one of the ignition points rather of of listening to producers, to having lots of conversations with producers and developers, but producers talking about how much, how hard it was to make their interactive documentary projects, um, both in kind of traditional video, inter interactive video, if there is such a thing as traditional interactive video and immersive, um, and how much of their budget was being spent on development. And then the developers who insisted that each project needed to be treated as a beautiful, unique snowflake and uh, so the producers ended up with less, uh, less of a vision, less of their vision delivered than they hoped because more was being spent on technology and less was ending up on screen. Um, and I think what was particularly frustrating, list, well, I, I'd also that sort of chimed with my experience of working at places like the BBC, where I had, I mean, my own personal experience of making interactive projects, but also watching larger projects at places like the BBC, where large amounts of money were was being spent on small teams being brought together to build projects that were one-offs where custom code would be developed, everybody would do a bunch of learning, then the team would be disbanded, the code would expire, 
um, get out of date and uh, we'd start all over again. And then a couple of years later, somebody would come together with another idea for another branching narrative story and it would happen all over again. And I felt like there had to be a better way. Um, and so those conversations at IDOCS 2018 started us down a path, uh, Kate and I. Um, and, and part of the reason for that was the timing of, you know, I've been waiting for a really long time for this moment of streaming video, waiting for streaming video to kind of pervade all of our devices. The way that we consume video is, is changing so much that, you know, streaming video, audience behavior demand has reached this, this, this tipping point of everything we watch, every video we watch, where we're prompted to watch another and another, and where we used to lean back to watch things, now we lean forward. And Netflix, as the kind of leader in the streaming video on demand space, had seen this too. And Carla Engelbrecht there had started a project where um, they were creating interactive projects to live on the Netflix platform. This is one from BBC that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, stories where on screen buttons would let viewers be able to interact with the story and control the story. The most well known of those that most of you will have heard of, I would think, is Bandersnatch, which won the Emmy for the kind of mainstream Emmy for outstanding television movie uh, a couple of years ago, at heralding the arrival of interactive video stories into the mainstream. And Netflix have sort of gone on to make and about another dozen of these in all sorts of genres, comedy and lots of kids and uh, Bear Grylls, you versus Wild, where you get to try and kill Bear Grylls. And it's hard to see what exactly their strategic aim for it is in there, except for exploring this, uh, this area between film and games. Um, alongside that, you know, um, where we used to be used to CD-ROM interactive uh, full motion video games, there are these games appearing on PCs and consoles where films are being made interactive. There's a, here's a range of four that um, uh, are on PC and PlayStation that are genre films, horror films, gangster films, thriller films um, that are uh, doing successfully as a result of this, this moment in time. Um, and I think, and interestingly, um, you know, when the when this Netflix started ex experimenting with this, particularly with Bandersnatch, um, Charlie Brooker talked about the process of making it, and I'm sure lots of people in the audience will identify with this, as like doing a Rubik's cube inside your brain. Um, it was incredibly complicated. There were no tools aimed at writers, producers wanting to tell stories in this way. And uh, Bandersnatch rather kind of mirrored that message um, with this story of this young um, video programmer. Um, I said everybody went a bit bananas at some point. I think that, you know, we're used to those of us who have explored the intersection of digital and, and uh, traditional media storytelling are used to this moment of mapping things out in paper, in traditional tools, and then things just turning into game design. Um, and we'll come back a bit to that in a second. The, you know, the experience for traditional TV producers and video producers is, you know, what, what, what the Bandersnatch producer said was similar to what a lot of the people at iDocs were saying. If we'd known how difficult it was gonna be, we might not have done it. Um, and some other, uh, while we were going, uh, developing Stornoway, uh, the BBC R&D team, we heard a year ago here, also Mike Armstrong and Bronnie delivered a presentation about story format and story kit, um, which a lot of you will have seen, you know, the BBC's own in-house tools for creating interactive and, and all sorts of different layered stories. Um, and, and they're kind of, they had a couple of different productions that explored this Instagramification and this episode of Click 1000 their technology program, where again, actually the production team got totally carried away, a bit like Netflix sort of exploring these big high budget concepts um, and bit off a bit more than they can chew. And so the first big project that they made was a similar experience for the production team, even though they had a few more tools there. And I guess that's where um, skipping to the end of the story, like all good uh, non-linear stories, um, that's where we decided to create a tool that was a simple code-free tool for producers of all kinds. Um, I was very excited coming from a theatre background at the idea that we could create something um, that any creative producer could work with developers and other interdisciplinary teams to create this kind of content. So we're just going to 
give you a little three minute uh, demo. I think Martin's going to play it for us. Um, this is from our website. It's our getting started tool. If you want to go there and have a muck about, there's a free trial. So please feel free. Um, you're now going to see a, a virtual version of Roo and then we'll come back to the rest of the presentation. Hi, how are you? I'm Roo Howe. I'm creator of stornaway.io and I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to show you where things are so that you can get started straight away. Click the button on the dashboard to create a project. Give it a name, but don't worry about filling in the details or the settings at the moment. You can come back to that. This is your story map, and this is where all the magic happens. The core element of Stornoway is the story island, which is our term for scene or a location, maybe a short clip, depending on what you're working on, a block of story. Make more story islands with the add island button at the top, and then lay them out here like post-it notes on a wall. Double click in them to jot down a name or ideas in the description box and then drag arrows to connect them up however you want. The arrows show the on-screen choices that a viewer will take to move on at the end of each island. This is the sidebar which you open and close with this button at the top right and it contains all of the information about each island. Description, the on-screen choices, where you upload your video file, game logic, story notes and an interactive script if you need one. To play test your story immediately, click play at the top. The private player will open up. This is visible only to you and your team. You can do this even before you've uploaded any video. We'll just show you this placeholder video instead with a helpful description over the top if you want. The buttons you see here are in the default style. They're set to appear for 10 seconds at the end of this island, but you can add up to four choices in different positions and styles and colors and timings or upload any button images of your own. And here as it moves on, you'll see a video clip that I've uploaded for the next island. I've used the same button style here, but different colors. And I've set them to move on when clicked rather than waiting for the video scene to finish. This playtesting and previs is one of the most revolutionary impacts of Stornoway. No more waiting until the end of the project to test and see if the story works, which has ruined so many interactive projects in the past. Stornoway.io will save you masses of money and time and hugely improve the end result. On the left of each island, you can see our tabbed variants. Variants are alternative versions of an island. Perhaps there's different actions or dialogue depending on what the viewer has seen up to this point in the story. In any other flowchart tool, these different versions of an island will be shown as separate boxes, which quickly gets very messy and unreadable. But Stornoway's patented variant system keeps everything neatly together for writing and editing and shooting. To share your project with your team, click settings and add collaborators. And when it's done and you're ready to share it with the world, click publish and either publish it to a stornoway.io page or embed our fantastic player on your web page or app. When you create a project, you're confronted with a blank page. Don't be afraid of the blank page. Get stuck in, create some islands, link them up, upload some phone videos or stock footage or whatever. Have a play and share. It is magic when you see it come together just with a drag and a drop. My suggestion is keep it simple and short and give the viewer a chance to watch and replay. That's where the real joy comes in. Interactive filmmaking used to be difficult and expensive. With Stornoway.io, it is easy and fun. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have fun and I hope you have a great day. Great. So I think as you can see, hopefully from that, it's very much uh, designed in this version for being able to map out branching narrative stories. And invariably, when we talk to people about this, they reference those fighting fantasy and choose your own adventure books from, from way back. Um, and that kind of first experience we had of hypertext, uh, before hypertext, of flicking through books, finding a way through, in the, in the case of these, always trying to find your way to one ending, page 400, without dying or getting sent back to the beginning. Um, and I think uh, that analog experience of it um, has seeded, it's quite interesting there, are, you know, coming back to these uh, games here, there a lot of them, all of these are made by British uh, producers and filmmakers and game makers, and there are a lot more. There's a real kind of British sensibility about this um, and a kind of center for excellence here um, on this side of the pond and in, in Bristol, uh, you know, a lot of interests, hence IDOCs. 
Um, and it, it, there's a, an understanding of this place, well, between film and games. Yes, so my first question around this, um, not being a gamer, was, you know, is this a story or a game? You know, wh what is this form? And uh, when we launched last year, we talked to Daniel Ifigan, creative director at Aardman, um, of interactive and uh, for a piece that we did for the children's media conference about the, these new trends in interactive, particularly with kids. And he had a really good um, thing to say on, on the subject. Yeah, it can seem, it can either seem very limited if you're coming off the back of kind of gaming um, or seem like a, a massive expanse if you're kind of coming from linear um, in terms of that interactivity. But what I, what I adore about it is its purity. Um, I think it gives us a chance to to look at narrative and interactive narrative as an as an art form, um, which doesn't make it not part of gaming and doesn't make it not part of filmmaking. But I do think there is there is something independent about it, about that kind of form, like a progression of storytelling, and that's what I love about it. And apologies for the screen quality there. We were filming uh, in lockdown on Zoom. There's a lot of a lot of lockdown filming has been happening for all of this over the last year. I think that what he talks about that purity and that simplicity is something you know. I guess that's the theme that we're trying to explore here today and thinking about a lot, which is there's a lot of you know we are working with TV production companies making things for streaming video platforms. Alongside that, there's this other huge potential for exploring these stories, which um, I know a lot of you at the Face Media Studio are, before, are, are exploring and. Uh, people in theatre and, and culture and business and all kinds of different ways are exploring in little ways. And I think opening up the means of production for this really uh, unlocks quite a lot of potential. My, my a couple of quotes that called spring, spring to mind from um, from filmmaking, you know, that you really sort of sparked my, I, I was, I've always been very interested in lo-fi filmmaking and smaller and smaller uh, use of video. And I think, you know, John Cocteau's film will only become an art when its materials are inexpensive as pencil and paper. And Francis Coppola's, my hope is that one day some little fat girl in Ohio will make a beautiful film with her father's little eight millimeter camcorder and she'll become the next Mozart and the professionalism of the film will be smashed forever. He said, making Apocalypse Now in 1978. Um, and I, th that sensibility of trying to create something lo-fi and nimble and iterative, um, is kind of at the heart of what we're trying to do and open and something that's sustainable and things will live on and not just die with proprietary technology. And as we launched, well. Yeah, as we launched and we were talking to TV and film producers because of course that's where we were advised initially to start. Um, a, a, a Bristol based theatre company found us through a contact I had, um, Jack Drury from the uh, Wardrobe Theatre. Um, they were trying to make an interactive film because they couldn't perform on stage. Um, they had got uh, a number of actors in different locations filming themselves. It was an incredible, it was 72. So they made it in 72 hours, never done anything with film before. 30, and then, and then just, different scenes and, and yeah. just before they were about to release it, they they thought, how, that, how are we gonna do this? Um, and so they found us through some amazing um, twist of fate. And so this was delivered in 72 hours um, uh, on their website. You can go and watch it. It's a children's uh, quest game uh, called yes. Selector Quest. And there are- They're Pins and Needles Productions. And this is at selectorquest.co.uk. And Martin, if you could just play a little taster trailer. Um, what's lots of things that are interesting about that um, in terms of how easy it was for them to make and how you know quickly they put it together but you know one of the really big takeaways through all of these experiments and all the different things that have been made that are not massive budgets that have a lot to lot to teach us about uh, experimenting with these new forms is 
what happens when you are able to iterate and do things quickly and, and show things to an audience. Emma, the, the director of uh, at, at Pins and Needles, talked about showing her six-year-old this. My, I don't know if you can read this on the slide. She said, my six-year-old was initially completely freaked out because it was her first experience of having a choice that would affect narrative. You could see it playing on her mind about the control she'd had. Inevitably, she came back to the game and suddenly became completely hooked on the choice mechanic. And she just wanted to play it again and again. It was a branching narrative story going through the freaky forest, as you saw there, meeting different characters and finding one ending, lots of nasty ways to die. Um, and that, um, th that way of iterating and, and looking at these things and being able to come and be back on those, that, that, uh, this, this was a map that we made for a story while we were building Stornoway, we were playing with projects. This was a, one of the films we used as a tester for the workflows. Um, and before we had the tools, alongside the digital, other digital tools we were playing with, we just tore up pieces of paper and stuck it onto the wall. And the bit that we couldn't test really was how the audience felt. So I think there's a really interesting thing about this form. And there's a reason why theatre makers are some of the first people who we're working with is because once you start being able to rehearse that experience between uh, creator and audience more um, intuitively, um, you get to fine tune that process. So this is how our story looked as an analog, and this is how it now looks in Stornoway. It's and a, Yeah, it's a story, it says Playable City, it's a story mapped out over Clifton in Bristol of a guy played by me, because we were doing it quick and dirty and shooting in a day and turning it around this, uh, it made going to work and exploring a couple of different timelines. If he does it go through the town, he does it go through the city. If we had a, a better Zoom connection from here, uh, Zoom makes the video a bit choppy, I'll show you a bit of playback, but you can have a test of it at lifemovesprettyfast.io. Um, and it, the game is just made within this map. You map out this, this story in the map, you draw little lines as you saw in that video, and then you just export it out. And um, having done that, I would now make the whole thing, we would make the whole thing half as long um, and quicker. Um, and I think that's, you know, as you take it onto the next project, that's what you learn. And I guess with the bigger projects, you don't, you don't get to learn that so much. I won't click into that. And one, one of the other things that, uh, thinking about things in this way, we, we broke the story, each, in, each of our individual islands of that story have their own individual URL. So you can then abstract the story and break it up, give yourself a map like a game that enables you to jump through it. So we took our story of moving through the city and then we made an abstract map of the city here. And you can click on any of these icons, these cartoons and jump straight into that moment of the story and carry on from there. And I think that's what we've seen happen is that once you stop thinking about branching narrative as sort of endlessly spiraling out, but actually a <laughs> A, 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 place, a place that yeah. you can play and converge and diverge, yeah. you start to really have fun as a creator. Um, and what we're seeing, um, uh, I guess what we've learned even in this short time that we've been launched is um, keeping it short. Uh, keeping it short is a good idea. You know, Netflix have worked on these very long projects. Actually, that ability to kind of watch and replay again is hugely fulfilling for the audience. It gets them talking to each other. Um, also this idea that, you know, getting away from just linear that actually good stories work linear, linearly and laterally um, so there's always there's again that sort of tension of things working in both directions um, and that the, the kind of issue of choices I mean we could go on forever talking about how people are playing with that um, you know there's immediately FOMO obviously if an if you're asking an audience to click on something they're always thinking about what they didn't click on and so Again, I think we're what we're seeing people playing with that in all sorts of really interesting ways. Working with a few different universities with film students coming up with ideas and testing them out and that journey of thinking about the idea they want to present and then understanding what it's like to actually sit in the shoes of the person playing and think, oh, actually, what, what would have happened if I hadn't made this choice? How do you go back and satisfy that? Um, and I, I, I guess you... Yeah, and we... And, the good thing is that we've been doing all this alongside someone like Netflix who have developed their own in-house tool, um, which their producers can use. So this is, um, you can learn a lot by watching their much bigger experiments. This is Tina Fey um, 
the writer for the, um, the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, they did an interactive special. And this is actually a bit that I really love because you see where this unique um, connection of the actor knows that the audience are there, the writer knows that the audience are there, there are these buttons on screen and, and there are just these lovely moments that feel like kind of improvisational theatre where, where you've kind of got, got space and time to reflect on all these different positions within, within the form. The, the, uh, the guy in the foreground of the screen there has no idea that he's in an interactive <laughs> film. The actress nominally, I mean, the main performer there, there does, nominally doesn't, but she's sucking on her straw waiting for you to make a decision and there's a bit of a wink at you. And that playing with that has been very fun. And people are doing it. I mean, we're now seeing people signing up from all over the world to make things for, for business, for education. Um, I think we'll probably come back to a couple of things that theatre and education um, for uh, this, you know, interactive video has had a, a history of being used in shoppable stuff, but the way that people are telling all kinds of stories that have some complexity around them, around the environment, around, you know, travel. Um, I think we live in this world that is, as Richard Boston would say, is VUCA, volatile, uncertain and complex and ambiguous. And we use stories to make sense of that. Um, and the, the way that you let people be able to explore different perspectives is, allows us to be able to satisfy that. We have a need to do it, it's just too hard. And we need to be playful with it. This is, I suppose, just a quick summary of the different types of things that are playing, not just the drama and comedy with playing path through a different story, but seeing things from different perspectives, which we see a lot in interactive documentary. I mean, interactive documentary makers have a, some of them have an uh, a ambiguous uh, opinion about story, but either way, you're a lot watching people's journeys through the content and juxtaposition of different things. Um, and also just personalizing the journey for people, for people making children's media that might appeal to six to eight year olds, but also 12 to 16 year olds, allows them to be able to opt into different parts of the stories and the relationships as they go through it. And we haven't got time to go into everybody out there who's who's playing with this form. Um, I think it's an emerging form and there are there's so much potential in all different areas. Um, the Egg in Bath, the Egg Theatre in Bath, are using Stornoway um, to create a, a creative learning portal that's going to sit alongside a show they're making about the life of Josephine Baker, the singer. Um, and it's been really interesting to watch them, again, using a very multidisciplinary team, educators, scriptwriters, performers, um, to make a sort of pre-show experience where you can navigate through different parts of the story and backstage, a post-show one where you can go and, you know, ask questions of the actors, for example, but, you know, you ask the question. And then in the middle, um, uh, a sort of time travel, essentially, where you get to hold um, Josephine Baker's grandson's hand and, and go explore different areas of New Orleans at the time that she was um, working. And then if we just move on here, um, this is uh, just as a contrast to that, a theatre company in uh, Germany who are making an interactive, as we speak, they're filming an interactive version of Pinocchio. They were going to do it as live performance, um, but they've decided uh, to do it again with Stornoway and they are playing with the idea of uh, good and bad. Um, you know, what is a good boy? And they are, I've seen some of the shots for it. I can't wait to um, share it with people because they're having a lot of fun with that idea of moral choices. I think, um, you know, there's so much ground to be explored there. Theirs will just be available on a website. The Josephine Baker experience is gonna be uh, designed for people to be able to, for teachers to be able to play on interactive whiteboards and get people's choices about what's happening through it as well as also being able to be played in the web and, and mobile. But um, uh, I think the, the other way in which these, you know, moderated experiences through here uh, is American PBS station that chopped up episode and episodes of Arthur into little chunks and created a little choose your own adventure story that they then did via live chat. And we're seeing quite a lot of things through Twitch and um, through live chat, people mediating these interactive stories. Um, and then it gets really experimental with <laughs> film students uh, and people playing with things where 
you're just creating juxtapositions between different chunks of video. This is a circular. You, you, this is well, I love this because it was our first circular map in Stornoway um, that wasn't, you know, linear. It's amazing how hard it is to get out of linear. And uh, this was <laughs> just a group of film students creating short films and connecting them up. So they created this sort of endlessly spiraling loop. I think they called it the circle of hell. Yeah, it's bad <laughs> things happening to all these people. And each each time you have a a link, there's some connection between each of these films that creates an interesting juxtaposition. Uh, this is Dan, to, to, to bring us home, Danny Fagan again uh, from our CMC video last year, just talking about the ways as you start to think about, you know, we are, uh, wh where these things get played out. I think, you know, I think Netflix have done great pioneering, pushing, um, giving us a really viable option to create this work and I really hope they continue to have great success with it because it's a beacon um, but yeah I do think there's some really blurry and exciting spaces forming that will allow this kind of stuff to happen I think Google Stadia for example is a is a great example and there's similar rumblings you know with what um, Amazon are up to with Twitch and so I feel like this kind of blurrier spaces to allow you to experience, to sit back and experience, play a, uh, a piece of video, but in an interactive way, will just continue to increase. So yeah, I'm quite excited for that. At the heart, with that in mind, at the heart of what we built and the reason we built it, apart from trying to make something simple for creatives was not creating something that would let, it would, it would keep you trapped in there or be sort of beholden to some proprietary technology. And what you create within Stornoway, you know, comes out via a simple JSON file that can be a da simple open data file um, that can be then played with and imported to. We're working um, soon to release our YouTube publishing tool that will allow us to be able to publish put Stornoway tools into YouTube's interactivity to deliver to other platforms, mobile and consoles and PCs via Unity, just taking the project out and bringing it into a Unity project. Oh, I've got Unity there twice. Um, 360 VR obviously is a, you know, the way that we navigate through virtual spaces with branching narrative. It's a bit too hard. There are obviously different ways of doing it, but trying to simplify that through Stornoway and then audio experiences and, and many more. But Stornoway is, our own platform is one way. We have a player. You can embed it on any site and see it on mobile. That's one way to deliver it. But there are obviously lots of other ways. And uh, we've been talking to the BBC, you know, further to their talk that you saw last year with Storyformer and StoryKit. They've open sourced their object-based media uh, data model. And uh, we've been looking at the compatibilities between that and Stornoway's data model to be able to exchange things between our system and their system. And that's kind of what I see as the vision of the future of this is that, you know, rather like with post-production and for broadcast or film, you make things in a production tool, but they're to be delivered anywhere. And that just will kind of open up the market to be able to do all sorts of things with it. I think that's it for the moment. Um, I, if you want to uh, play any of those films um, that we've been talking about or find out more, you can go to our website, stornoway.io. Um, and it would be really great to know if there's anyone out there who wants to ask us any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. That, that was fantastic. I'm sure the questions will get to us as soon as people get to them. But uh, for now, I, I've got plenty of questions. But first, can I just say that as... Oh, dude. Oh, Sorry. Oh, that was, that was a, a little odd. Uh, yeah. As someone who has built one of those uh, one-off interactive <laughs> video systems, <Yes>. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but... But yeah, I, w I wanted to follow up on what you were saying just there towards the end. I know a lot of our, you know, a lot of people when they they get excited about doing, you know, new media work and building interactive stuff, and they, they want to throw the kitchen sink at it and it becomes this 360 yeah. degree binaural VR mixed reality experience. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that and which of those sort of additional technologies you feel um sort of synergize well with uh this sort of thing or is that that's still fertile think, ground for experimentation it's a very good question and i think that um you know i'm i'm a big fan of so, so in, it's really interesting watching culture businesses 
businesses, culture organizations and businesses uh, grapple with how the, the innovation pathway and seeing, you know, a lot of, of innovation R&D money going into projects like uh, Dream, you know, like the, the, the RSCs thing and um, recently um, as well as smaller, you know, independent touring theatre companies playing with really small, nimble ideas. And I think, um, you know, we're talking to, it's, we, a lot of people use Stonaway without us talking to them at all. They just sign up and use it. The people that we do work with and talk to very often come in with a great grab bag of stuff like volumetric capture meets, you know, some uh, 360 VR meets a browser game, meets all these different things. And actually as they hone it down and they think about what's achievable, that thing, I guess that we were talking about here, which is that, testing and playing with ideas that have some level of audience interactivity through a story is the first part of that. And just seeing how that plays out, being able to map that out and storm away and see how that plays out gets you, gets them 80% of the way there. And some of them just stop at that point. They're like, okay, phase one, let's do this. And then let's see how we can bring it into 360 and we see how we can bring it into those other things. I think that this is this uh, the, the, the people who are seizing on this and enjoying it, the people who are able to use it to put the story first and the technology second. And I think that quite a lot of innovation projects are trying to figure out how to fit story into technology. And that's probably unfair now these days, but that has always <laughs> been the case. But they, it's it's this balance of gimmickry versus, you know, trying to do something genuinely new. Um, and, you know, this has a long history of those game books, CD-ROMs, you know, adventure games, laser disc you know, like there's some level of this that is not new. It's, but it yet actually, because it's been hard and because everything gets thrown away and lost, we still haven't really advanced how we, the language of it. There's still not a huge amount of academic papers and writing about this, you know, what Danny Figgin was there talking about, the purity of this interactive storytelling. And it's kind of at the heart of a lot of immersive experiences, really. Yeah. Um, and I sometimes you just don't get to see that until the very end and then it's too late to change it. I was going to say that coming from a theatre background, I feel it's, you know, there's lots of parallels about scratch shows and kind yeah, yeah. Of West End shows, you know, um, in that, you know, most theatre projects begin with sort of nothing and a bare room and some people who want to say something um, and uh, want to tell a story. And that if you skip that process, you know, you skip it at your peril, really, because that is the heart of the thing. It can then grow and become. The West End show and there have to be lots of things that happen to it to become the West End show you know you might have to change things you might have to bring in um huge numbers of cast members or or you know lights or effects um and I think I that's how I see it is that we we're very keen on those sort of that catalyst moment where anybody can just create the story and then it can go and live wherever it needs to live and I think you know we're definitely not you know, this is happening in the world. Um, and it's just really fun to be part of that because I think having heard Rue talk about this form for so long and so many people who've worked in it, you know, it, it's frustrating over and over again. And it's nice to see that those tools are starting to be made and um, opening it out. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Take a pause for that a was a long <laughs> answer. We were just giving time. Oh, that was good. We, we managed to get, get a few questions in from the chat while you were doing that. It's <laughs> great, great stuff. So, yeah, uh, leading on actually nicely, Mark Jacobs asks uh, Mark have, Jacobs, you seen, Mark. have you seen your software used in any ways that have particularly impressed or inspired you? And how do you see the software evolving over the next year or so? Good question. I mean, um, it's hard to pick favourites and we are NDA'd on quite a lot of projects and that makes it a bit difficult to talk about them. But I think what's uh, what's really nice is to see um, uh, kind of what we were just talking about. People who are, who are really experienced storytellers in what would otherwise be linear stories, whether that's natural history uh, in Mark's wheelhouse or whether it is, um, you know, really talented producer editors putting together stories that explore natural history, animal behavior and environments in interesting ways and specialist factual stuff for TV. Um, and um, people who are telling really kooky theater stories that allow the audience into a digital room without it having to have goggles. I guess it's that sense of an immersive experience for that. 
I've nothing against goggles. I've got some goggles over there, but there's something about opening it up. And I think what was, it's quite interesting, Maddie Rose's, um, uh, you know, a piece of work recently talking about sending out goggles to people free to use in uh, households and them just not really getting used after a while. They get used as a, as a bit of a gimmick. And, and you know, Catherine Allen from Limon are talking about this dearth of gateway content for people. You know, all of the big projects lean really hard into six degrees of freedom, uh, super interactive stuff and, and location-based experiences. And there's this sort of gap of stuff for people who just want to put on a headset or have something that is an, a slightly interactive story, you know, and I think we underestimate, um, we underestimate that big chunk of just changing from linear to interactive without just going, without throwing the kitchen sink at it and, and boiling the ocean or whatever other thing you want to do. Um, I think what's going to happen, we've learned a lot about the UX of, of our, we tried to keep everything really simple. We tried, we learned a lot about the user experience of how people interact with Stornoway, even having kept it simple and with constantly improving it and I think next couple of weeks we've got some things that will make it even easier for people to just be able to plan stuff out without having any video and then more integrations and sort of further work coming in the summer into things like Unity and 360 and 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 we're just trying to take it step by step we you know we're a small Bristol company being used by lots of people everywhere for all sorts of things but uh it's important to just try and make sure everything is built based on what people actually need rather than everything that I want to do, which is <laughs> just 500 lines long of features. Did, I was going to let another question in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, I should actually give, give a very small plug there. Uh, Catherine Allen is going to be uh, with us in a couple of weeks time. And I believe she's going to be talking about some of those issues as well. Right. So, um, Manon Usher, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, asks, uh, could you say a little bit more about audio, which was at the bottom of your list? Hi. Uh, do you want to say something about audio? Well, I'm obviously obsessed by audio because I'm a <laughs> singer. And um, actually, one of the things I keep saying to lots of the producers who we're working with is, set, is like, just focus on the sound. <laughs> you know, the pictures can do stuff, but actually it's the sound that will take them tr travel. And I think that's actually what I was going to say. The, there's a sort of immediacy and intimacy that is possible with this content that is is not what you think when you're like click on this either yes no you know there's a kind of real intimacy that I think lends itself to sound journeys hugely and at the moment people are playing with that um, by just uploading kind of visuals with audio attached and the audio is leading you through um, we're going to what you know our plan is to enable purely interactive audio stories because um, yeah, I think it's a really exciting form, and um, and particularly after a year of staring at our screens, um, <laughs> the idea that we can just put some headphones in and be taken on a journey that we can move through. Um, I know there's some really exciting projects here in Bristol. Bristol and Bath R&D are working in all sorts of ways on this, and, and we're hoping to kind of dovetail and learn from from the producers who are working in this area. Yeah, BBC too have been doing really some really interesting stuff with with um, Storyformer and some some other partners. And I think um, Ellie Chadwick's doing something with some with some binaural audio in it. I'm super interested in. I mean, the, the core delivery mechanism for the Stornoway platform when you deliver out to our web player is an open source. You know, it's based on the open source video JS video web player with some custom our custom code on the top to add the interactivity and so it's a kind of web video and audio player i guess the trick is what are the affordances what are the you know in 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 this sort of uh, academic speak what are the what are the buttons how do you recreate the buttons and what i obviously one opportunity is uh voice assistant kind of you know being able to give audio commands to interact with the story and there are some that you can listen to and bbc's made some um and uh, there are some on Alexa that you can play. Um, and I think knowing what people want to do with audio, and we have been talking to a few different people about that, and how they wanted to explore it will really help us build out those tools in a way that will work. And in the meantime, add, add some audio to a video file, upload it into Stornoway and, and play with it with the buttons on screen. And you can kind of create a combined audio first audio video experience. Audio video, audio visual. <laughs> Does that, is that helpful? I can't ask you because it's all mediated. 
I think that was that was, that was very helpful. Uh, well, I Great. thought so. Uh, Perfect. Um, <laughs> That actually does touch on another thing. Uh, you mentioned the BBC's uh, story former and story kit. Yeah. I, I wonder if I could very cheekily ask you to sort of give a, a bit of a comparison between what you're doing and what they're doing and what, <laughs> what, what you would see as the strengths and weaknesses of both. Or uh, I mean, they're very, they're very similar in many ways. I think they are, um, there are, there are more, you know, Storyformers, Storyformers Story Kit is part of a larger object-based media project that, um, you know, might, that, that they talked about last year when in their lunchtime talk of um, uh, thinking about how to break up media into, into elements. And they've done an amazing job of creating an open source data model for that, which is the, you know, it's the future of being able to enable everybody to be able to buy into some sort of different, maybe not one standard, maybe because there's always a million standards, but standards where you can exchange data. And I think Storyformer came from the same place of wanting to give creators the ability to be able to visually map out a story and then deliver it. And it has some more bells and whistles in some ways um, to, you know, to allow you to add in, I think they've already got in 360, uh, you know, video and, and pictures um, in there and binaural audio. Um, and the, the sort of the key difference, here, one of the key differences is delivery point is that, um, and again, you should go, go to the BBC Maker Box and ask to try it and download it. They, you can, they, BBC sanctioned projects will live in BBC Taster, I think. Um, and then there's also the ability to be able to deliver it and host it on your own place. And it's the understanding the delivery points and where it's going is part of why you might use um, Stornoway versus story kit um, and and then just kind of personal preference about nice. access to the tools that you know you can download theirs and keep using it for free we have a subscription model um, that will evolve over time where you can trial it and email us and get an extended trial um, and then sign up and use it and it's a kind of hosted model that is just a slightly slightly different way of looking at it yeah as a sort of writer creator non-technical person um, uh, the story, store, Stornoway sort of interface for me, um, uh, I've really enjoyed um, kind of um, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, I, I guess in a way I've come on the journey with Stornoway where I've seen now the potential for that and where it can go, but that sort of the simplicity of entry and the fact that there's no barrier to entry, you don't have to know anything about nodes or codes or, you know, anything. Um, and, and for me that I, that's why I really enjoyed uh, kind of helping with the design of the tool and listening to other creative producers and feeding that in. Yeah, I think, and I think Storyformer comes from that same essence of just, I think Mike Armstrong talked about how he, he wanted to make something so that a producer would never have to look at a piece of JavaScript or write any JavaScript, just kind of block things out and do that. And, um, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, that will start to unlock some I know that there are people within the BBC who are interested at in looking at it for different projects and the BBC starting to do it just kind of rising tide, you know, yeah. doesn't sink all ships, does it? It does the opposite thing. It <laughs> lifts all ships. Um, and it uh, <laughs> um, depends on what type of tide it is, I suppose. Um, and uh, But yeah, the people using it at the BBC to make content now that it's available within their standard media player, I think is really exciting for those smaller, more nimble projects. I hope that they pick it up and run with it. Great, thanks. Um, we do still have time for a few more questions if anyone wants to get one in, but I want to follow up just on something you, you said there, and uh, you know, it's slightly crass, but could you talk a bit more about the financial model that you're working from here, and you know, how do you make money out of this? And how That's much a good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. We, we are, um, so, you know, we're a small startup, Bristol-based startup um, that raised a small amount of money to be able to build the first part of the software with a Bristol based development team um, and uh, streaming video. Like if I, if I could wave a wand, I would give this away for free, but uh, <laughs> streaming video costs us money essentially. And um, we, it's hosted in Amazon. So all the time that you're streaming video from our player, uh, it costs a small amount of money. So that the, the subscription essentially covers the cost of that. And we, uh, you know, have then our, Kind of running costs. So, as a commercial non-grant funded business, slightly grant, we've got to, you know, 
digital innovation fund grant to do some building but as a non um you know as a as a commercial business that's the that's the standard SaaS model for pieces of you know for software the web software that you sign up to so it's a web platform you know will stay constantly updated um and then where you know where uh, one of the things we're going to be moving to is the summer one of the things i was keenest to think about and the other thing that came up at you know i came up a lot at idocs 2018 talking to them about that and has been over idocs over the, all of the years is what happens to projects you know the the history of interactive projects is a graveyard in, even in flipping VR now, you know, there's things that, that there are outdated on old headsets that no longer work on new ones. Trying to create a kind of open standard package that people can download and archive. I know the BBC have been working on that as well. And so that you can take your projects and take it away and just host it yourself or store it yourself. At the moment in our first version, we didn't really set out to create a platform, but we had to create a platform in order to be able to let people be able to play test things. So, so that first model is create your project, subscribe, publish it on our system and then you'll take a package away and you can do what you want with it and host it yourself you know, using a, a, an open player. Um, and I think COVID-19 um, has created this, you know, like a lot of people are saying, it's created as a very fast forward technical kind of adoption in all sorts of businesses and for me, the exciting thing is that the kind of one of the original parts of the vision was also that whilst this was a, a tool that could work for TV producers, actually anybody over there in any part of the world who wants to make a connected video story can pick it up and and tell their story. And that that does, you know, we're seeing a really, a really lovely increase of interest from producers in all different markets all yeah. over the world. That's interesting. I mean, there are there are different types of people. There are people who don't want to pay because they want to use open source tools and just use something that's as cheap as possible because they don't have a budget. And then there are people who actively want to pay because they want the support and they want the budget. And that's going to be interesting as we find that out because we we're just getting a lot of people signing up for all sorts of different things and they are doing it for commercial projects that have a kind of fixed budget and timeline. And they'll just they either arrange something with us or or just self service and um, so yeah that's trying to find a way to make that most sustainable for for everybody and enable that for you know universities and culture business to culture organizations i keep on calling them culture businesses i sound like, <laughs> sound like somebody from the uh anyway i mean i think that and the shorter answer to that martin is you know if we'd done this with the guarantee that it was gonna you know uh enable us to walk off you know into the sunset with lots of money um we would never have done it at all <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a kind of element of we this was a real kind of that we want this to happen and we need to make it and I, I, I three years ago um i talked to a filmmaker friend and i'd been talking about making this tool and rue's idea and and she was like you know what kate nothing is anything until it's on paper and the moment we put it on paper it became it had a, a reality and then yeah. it had a momentum and now we're just kind of going with the momentum and really enjoying the journey that is non-linear <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. I'm doing yeah. it in lockdown. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I certainly know that we've found, yeah, a lot of uh, people we work with in the studio who are, you know, who have normally been based in in live media or you know theatre or dance or uh, or even sort of uh, visual artists have suddenly in the last year had to make that move towards uh, online digital work, and a yeah. lot of them are exploring these sort of. Uh, different um, new media approaches so one question I wanted to ask is like what advice would you have for someone like that who wanted to learn the, the craft of interactive storytelling well good question I mean uh, it's an interesting question because it's just so depends on what it is you're trying to do what the one thing is to play I mean get get in touch with us for because it's nice to say hello and have human contact, that's good. And we're happy to talk and share our thoughts and, and uh, learnings about everything. But uh, I think there's still this big open space, you know, talking to some of the film professors that we're working with. Um, you know, to, uh, we were at a session yesterday afternoon with a whole bunch of film students um, at uh, Southampton Solent University who were showing us their film ideas that they'd got and they were just getting ready to shoot and talking to the to Dr. Roy Haney there, who's, you know, shepherding them all through it. 
and and trying to go through the literature of what's there there's just you know there's it's a it's a bit of a wild west you know there's a lot to be discovered and a lot to be learned and like there is in anything you can you can innovate and you can pioneer there's things to watch and to learn and to you know watch whether it's you know uh, the things on netflix that kate talked about or those games that are on you know pc and console or even kind of walking simulator games like like dear esther where you just sort of or firewatch where you're just wandering around the landscape those kind of things where you're part of a story do teach you something um because you can make it location based or you can make it theme based or but map it out just the most important thing is that play testing and the introduction of time i think time as a dimension is super uh hard to recreate by putting things on a wall that map that we had of what life moves pretty fast looked like on the wall. It doesn't matter that how many of these things I've made in the past until it lives in Stornoway and you can play it or not or story form or whatever, till you can play it through and play test it. Yeah. Uh, you don't get a sense of what it's like to, of how long those things are gonna be. And I think that's why a lot of, you know, theater based things in the past uh, or things that live, you know, that come out of um, uh, ideas from, cultural heritage organizations trying to explore things often have a very long beginning where they do a lot of expedition before you get to the first choice because they're not really thinking like they, they can't you sit in the take seat. them straight in you've got to get right you in know, and, and that, in that way it's no different you know regardless of the form that's what's so exciting about it is it you know the same rules apply the story's got to be good <laughs> um and and is that too harsh no no but, it's, you know, it's true but and, the story, and i think so that's yeah. what's so exciting is that whatever discipline you're working in you know use the skills that you've got and and then sketch it out and play it and test it and think and it'll help you you know but this, it'll become yeah, something. The story can still be good as a passive experience. Yeah. But once you tell somebody that they're expected to engage, the different part of their brain turns on. Yeah. You know, people that kind of we did, you know, audience focus groups and feedback. Um, and and kids particularly talking about this the different thing of when you're watching something where you know somebody's about to ask you a question, it's a bit like being in class, but even more intense because it's just you and the screen. Your brain is switched on because it's it's absorbing information to let inform you for the next decision and that is I mean, it's like immersive pervasive theater isn't it wandering around in the space you're you're not just sitting in a seat watching something or you know that that introduction of that thing means you can't do a whole bunch of telling somebody you write out a page of script and you're like this is great this sets the whole thing up but because somebody's in the mindset they're waiting to press something they're just like come on yeah. cut to the chase and that that thing sort of ties into that gateway ex interactive experience you're either giving somebody a passive experience there's a there's a PlayStation VR game called something like Ocean Deep, where you just put the headset on and you sink down into the earth and a shark comes and attacks you and scares the Jesus out of you and you go back to the surface. But you're <laughs> you're definitely bought into the idea that's a passive experience. And that's fine because it's an immersive passive 360 experience. If you're introducing interactivity, you just kind of have to see how that plays out over time and iterate and improve and speed. Great, thanks. Well, I think that's probably all we've got time for today. So I want to say thank you to both of you. This has been wonderful having you on. <laughs> thanks very much. It's been a delightful. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for hosting us gently. Great. And thanks for your questions, everyone. Let's say goodbye. <laughs> Take care. So before you all go, next week's talk is by studio resident and winner of the 2020 Ivor Novello Award for Sound Art, Kathy Hind. She'll be talking about her attempts to rewild water data and she'll share sounds, images and experiences from her encounters with watery environments. You can get news on all of the future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or subscribe to the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, give the video the thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link captioned version of the video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week. <laughs>